is everything good on the both microphones? Okay. <laughs> no? Hello? Testing? <laughs> Testing, one, two, three. Okay. I guess that's what you say? This one? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's get started. I'm flying. My arms are wings and I'm flying. I'm on top of the world soaring above this river. But then I start losing altitude. I'm falling. I flap harder looking down. I see my shirt brush the water. I'm falling. I look up. I'm still aloft, but barely. I'm tired, but I can't turn around. The water is a blaze up ahead. What? Do I stop flapping? If I do, I'll drown. If I don't, I'll fly into the fire. What do I do? My thoughts are interrupted as a surge of water drags me under the current, and I wake up. Typical days don't have the types of life and death decisions that you encounter in your nightmares. You usually aren't distracted or disoriented, and outcomes are rarely the end of the world. But there is one place that is everyone's worst nightmare, and that place is high school. <laughs> uh, I painted these scenes in high school. Our class was the first outlet I had where I could really express my feelings without words. It was a place where I could cope with the crazy things that kept me up at night. And it also helped me deal with a lot of social insecurities. And I dealt with normal high school emotions like stage fright. Um, and that yucky feeling of being exposed and vulnerable in front of my peers. That one crippling breakup, weird, the relationship only lasted two weeks. I was wondering if I was making the right choices in my life. Or if I was forced along my current path. And this is all you know, normal, end of the world, high school, extreme worry stuff. But also looking back, I see that my anxiety ran much deeper and was filled with more passion than I really could have handled without my artwork. My name is Amy Johnson, and I'm a senior mobile visual designer on the Arity Pattern Library team. There I design mobile interface components for Android and iOS applications. Previously, I worked at Allstate, Next Radio and Tag Station, and Motorola Mobility. Over the years, I've worked closely with UX architects, developers, researchers, content strategists, and business stakeholders to create awesome digital products. I'm also on the autism spectrum. I got the official diagnosis in November of 2016 and have since been learning how to properly cope with the life that I've been given. Prior to my diagnosis, I was frequently misdiagnosed and medicated for disorders that I didn't have. Through counseling and research, I now have explanations for all those surreal sensitivities that I've been having all my life. In this talk, I'm going to start off with some facts about autism and how it affects me, but I really want to get into how neurodiversity in general affects you. I'll talk about the hiring world, healthy work environments, and team collaboration advice that can benefit everyone in your workplace. So let's get started. I'm going to sip some water. <laughs> About 1% of the world population has autism spectrum, spectrum disorder. But think about that though. If 3.5 million Americans are autistic, then why don't we see more of them in the workforce? Well, there are a few reasons for that. 
One is that 80% of di diagnosed autistics can't hold down jobs. And this isn't because they can't complete the tasks that are asked of them, but more uh, related to their personality in their workplace or even cultural fit. Another reason is that coming out as autistic is an incredibly personal decision. Uh, when I first found out, uh, nothing technically changed in my life, but because I was predisposed to misconceptions about autism, I was somewhat embarrassed and a bit scared that I would lose my job if anybody found out. Another reason uh, is that there's a large chunk of the ASD population that doesn't realize they're autistic, especially women, because they present much differently than men and are typically diagnosed later in life, like me. There are many symptoms associated with being autistic, many of which are quite debilitating, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus more on the common ones that are recognizable in the workplace. There's difficulty with social communication, repetitive movements or behaviors, and sensory issues. Now, autistics have difficulty with verbal and nonverbal communication. Like, I avoid eye contact at all costs because it makes me incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> and I would equivocate that feeling to if you were to kiss a stranger on the lips. I'm a lot better with people I know, but other things that I face are um, not being able to understand facial cues or speaking up at the right time in, group set, in a group setting. Uh, rocking back and forth like a metronome or flapping your hands because you're just so excited about something or, or humming a single note to yourself at your desk. Uh, those are considered, those things are considered stimming and atypical people do these things to cope with extreme or overwhelming feelings. And when I just won't stop talking about Harry Potter, <laughs> it's not because I'm trying to annoy you. It's usually, <laughs> it's usually because I've had a stressful meeting, at least stressful for me, and I'm decompressing from it. That's just my quirk. I don't know if <laughs> other people. Um, and feelings of discomfort that result from smells, light, or noises are considered sensory issues. That smell good lotion that you're putting on at your desk might not be overpowering to a neurotypical person or most people in the office, um, but it's probably making me nauseous and want to throw up. Now, a lot of autistics have these sensitivities, yes, but I think a lot of neurotypical people can relate also. The autism spectrum disorder definition has grown to include those above the IQ of 85. And as the definition grows, the number of diagnosed people per year also grows from 8% to 15%. Also, as a result of this growth, uh, there's a term in the field that everyone hates. Uh, it's called high functioning. One of the reasons is because it implies that I, as a vocal adult with autism, have a lighter version of autism that is less severe than my counterparts that have it worse off in the verbal communication department. It's true that some people on the spectrum are mute or have trouble connecting what they're thinking to what they're saying. But I have the same sensory issues and communication difficulties as most on the spectrum. I've just learned over the years how to cope and assimilate into society through mimicking how other people act in public and how other people react to new scenarios and new situations that they're not used to. You don't get to see my sens sensory overloaded moments because those are personal to me and I've been lucky enough to be able to confine them to my private life. So what does this mean for me as a designer? Uh, it means that I approach problems from a different angle than most of my coworkers. I also have a lot of empathy for users whose brains work differently. I'm great at using common visual elements to create logical user experiences and puzzles don't faze me because I just think in shapes and color. My strengths lie in patterns 
and being autistic means I'm extremely passionate about my area of interest and will go above and beyond expectations simply because I love what I do and I want to make people happy. John Robinson wrote an article in Psychology Today last year about his autism that really hit home for me. He says, my perspective has allowed me to solve problems that are hard for others to crack, not because I'm smarter, but because I think differently and work with subtly atypical sensory inputs. 99% of the world's problems may not require a mind like mine, but 1% do. Perhaps that's why there's a sprinkling of us in the population. <laughs> and I think this is a great perspective on how aut autism impacts the world. Because being on the autism spectrum doesn't make me a worse teammate, and it doesn't mean I'm disabled. It simply means I'm a different teammate. I have different needs, and I have different ways of communicating. So let's shift our thinking from a specific diagnosis to the bigger picture. Neurodiversity is a concept where neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. These differences could include those labeled with autism spectrum disorder, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and a bunch of others that I'm not gonna list right now. <laughs> I am considered neuroatypical, neurodivergent, or ND. These terms simply mean that I have atypical patterns of thoughts or behavior. And someone who lacks any sort of mental or neurological illness is considered neurotypical or NT. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> In my experience, atypical people tend to flock towards creative and technical careers. It's typical for autistics to have a passionate narrow focus, like mine is native visual design, but somebody with ADHD may prefer to generalize or work on a broad range of topics all at once. So let's dig in what it means to hire a neurodiverse team. Microsoft and more than 50 other big name companies have been pushing to hire autistic adults into the workforce. They have found that autistics are some of the most passionate workers with acute attention to detail and patterns. The hiring model encourages diagnosed individuals to apply as they are in interview in ways that focus less on social interaction and more on exercises designed to see if they're a good fit or not. Once hired, they're paired with mentors and managers to guide them through typical working class environments, which is great and a great step towards neurodiversity, but there's a big flaw I see in this hiring model. It, it's that it requires a diagnosis. Because more men are diagnosed before the age of eight than women, women are usually misdiagnosed prior to their 30s. Yes, that's a 22 year difference. <laughs> this creates a very small in a pool of individuals willing to apply for these jobs in the first place and most of them are men. This also shows that focusing on a specific diagnosis could actually hinder a company's ability to be truly neurodiverse. Now, hiring a neurodiverse team could be beneficial to the effectiveness of whatever product that you're building, and this includes everyone under the neurodiverse umbrella or any other personality quirkiness that isn't deemed corporate. Uh, wow, I lost my words. <laughs> corporate, uh, corporate appropriate. Uh, from detail oriented to big picture solutioning, people who are wired different tend to think outside the box. A neuro neurodiverse teammates can be passionate or high energy, at least extroverted ones. Some are more calculated and introverted, absorbing information better in the form of tasks and subsequently very hard workers. 
So my advice to hiring managers is that ask, question, ask questions unrelated to the job description. You can really gauge a future employee's personality from things they like outside of work. Pick out those candidates that differ from those that are already on your team. Expect the unexpected. Now I say this because uh, interviews are inherently stressful environments and result in unexpected reactions and odd facial expressions sometimes. <laughs> and a lot of times, atypical people specifically answer questions quite bluntly and may reveal things about previous places of work that may be unflattering to bring up. Treat this as honesty and transparency because these qualities should be valued more than they are at most companies. And finally, give feedback even if you don't hire the individual. I think this is a de desire for uh, atypical and typical brains alike because feedback really gives closure, especially in those letdown situations. I also want to add that I did get feedback from a potential employer in a contract to hire situation. I got a bulleted list of reasons why I wasn't a good fit for the company. This was long before I was officially diagnosed, but I can still remember it, remember it quite vividly. They told me that my personality wasn't a good fit, that my facial expressions were odd or inappropriate when surprised or stressed. They told me I was too intense, and they told me I didn't communicate well and that I went off topic too often with clients. Okay, none of these reasons reflected the actual work that I produced, but they also didn't make any effort to help me learn from my mistakes. At the time, it was really devastating and depressing, um, but now I see it really wasn't a healthy environment for me to be in. Those were things I couldn't have, I couldn't help and that I shouldn't have been judged for in that way. But that experience and all of my ex experiences have led me to the healthy positions that I'm in today and helped me learn from social mistakes that I may have made in the past. Now, the hiring decision shouldn't all fall on the employers. Um, I'm here to tell anyone who considers themselves even a little bit different to really search for that optimal work environment. For atypical job seekers, don't feel obligated to talk about your diagnosis if you have one. A lot of times, expressing these facts can be distracting in an interview setting. So if you're uncomfortable talking about it, then don't. At the same time, if you're requesting accommodations at your future job, it might be good to bring up in a second interview to show that you're transparent and serious about the role. Also ask questions uh, about things that help you do your best work. So I personally look for companies that value a work-life balance and flexible work from home schedule. Uh, so I can work in an environment that's less stimulating than a corporate uh, office. Uh, make sure to advocate for things that not only make you comfortable, but also help you be productive. Pay attention during that building tour. <laughs> and this is really important. Um, see if it's an open office. How bright are the lights? Um, is the white no noise that they pump into the corporate environment, is it like super unbearable? How many people have their headphones on? How often do people get up from their desks? Also, very important, ask about health rooms and quiet rooms. I, ha I, I was fortunate enough to have these types of rooms at the last few places that I've worked. And they're usually situated near mother's rooms and are dark and secluded, uh, equipped with couches uh, and first aid stations. They aren't specifically made for people with ASD or people who are neurodiverse but they're a place where anybody can go to take a 30 minute break to wind down from a stressful meeting or intense situation. <laughs> uh, pay attention to how existing employees treat each other. 
Does it feel like a family? Are people generally courteous of each other's time? Ask, ask yourself if you're okay with that level of human interaction. And finally, it's okay to say no. If a company has a culture that is more active and high energy, but you're more in, introverted and shy, um, or re prefer a standard routine, then it's okay to decline. Finding the right fit is especially important for those who are neuroatypical. And if a company isn't flexible enough to accommodate some of your most basic needs, then it probably isn't a good place to be anyway. So I touched a little bit on environment, but let's dive a little deeper now. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> work, work environments these days have drastically changed from the cubicle farmlands of the past. With a push from startups in Silicon Valley, a lot of creative and technical companies are opting for open office floor plans to promote creativity and collaboration. Some companies don't even have assigned desks, like the current company. For anyone that may, might require quiet time or heads down work, it usually is difficult to find a secluded room. For people that yearn for a physical routine, not having an assigned desk can be very, very stressful. The last several companies I've worked at have had open office floor plans, and while sexy, they usually forget to plan in those opportunities for people to escape the crazy back and forth communications that happen out in the open. To work at my highest capacity, I require less fluorescent light. I usually go into conference rooms and like turn off the lights and then people <laughs> come in and they're like, are you okay in here? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> going back on track, okay. Uh, most likely my desk isn't the best place to hash out uh, rapid iterations of a prototype. So I think that Sometimes companies focus too much on time, on time in your seat and are less trusting than they should be because regardless of your neurological standing, a workplace based on trust and accountability is far more productive than those, than those that require you to be physically present at every moment. So say you know yourself well enough that you need some accommodations uh, to make your environment more comfortable and you to be more productive. Don't be afraid to brainstorm with your manager. Come to mutual and approved ways to make her work weeks better. Ask questions about and find out where the limits are in your job or soon to be job. Some things like office setup or work from home policies may not be as flexible with some companies. So find out where those lines are and try not to cross them. But also don't be ashamed for asking for exceptions because it's easy to overanalyze what others may think of your workplace routine, especially in a corporate environment. Um, but my advice is if you have a justifiable, justifiable reason to have a certain routine or a certain work environment, there's absolutely no shame in asking for what you need. And our work as creative individuals is ever evolving, so our work environments can be that way too. Ask facilities to rearrange desks, get involved in environmental planning. Back up your proposals with research from other companies, which is abundant these days. And also collaborate with other employees that have the same concerns as you. You have the power to make change, and if you do, it could help your entire team. So collaboration, <laughs> the third bullet. <laughs> I really like putting bullets in my slide. It really gives closure to the whole talk. <laughs> so there are a lot of different sources out there that give advice to those working with coworkers that are neurodiverse, a lot of content a lot of that content, though, uh, revolves around those that haven't necessarily held down a full-time job or are visibly on the spectrum. Let's get one thing straight, guys. 
Uh, it's not okay to diagnose your coworkers. It's also not okay to assume you know how anyone is feeling on a given day. I wanna promote work cultures that are really based on being human to each other rather than focusing so much on flaws and corporate norms. Uh, in the media, I, I've seen TV shows like Bones and The Good Doctor and a show called Atypical, and they're all great at really displaying to the public some of the social struggles we face uh, being on the spectrum and also what kind of coworkers we can be. Bones, if you don't know what it is, but it, it is a crime lab drama that specializes so it specializes in solving murders based on bone analysis. Temperance Brennan, or Bones, is the main character and is a savant with major social struggles. They never come out and say that she's on the spectrum. However, it is implied throughout the show that she is. She is highly intelligent and can see patterns so much faster than those around her. But this also means that she doesn't always relate to her coworkers very well or is even baffled by them. She's so great at her job, though, those things kind of fall to the wayside. The Good Doctor is a typical MD drama that revolves around an autistic character with acute social communication issues, but is all also highly intelligent. See a pattern? <laughs> um, he wants to become a surgeon, but has a lot of problems engaging in group activity activities and understanding the status quo. His manager that advocated for him really helps guide him and nurture him so he can learn how to fit in better. And Atypical is a new Netflix show that is quite incredible for the fact that it's the first I've seen that features an average autistic. It's a high school based drama that shows the world behind what the main character is feeling and what he does to cope with his sensitivities. If anything, it may over-exaggerate some things for the sake of drama, but I feel like it's a great show for, pe pe for people seeking to understand what we go through on a daily basis. We seek friendship and relationship and normal human being things. It just doesn't always come as natural. And because there are so many factors to consider when communicating with neurodiverse designers and developers, I can't go through all the different situations that you might encounter because there are a lot and there's a lot of awkward ones. <laughs> but people who are atypical, but also if any neurotypical person is acting the same way. Uh, difficulty understanding unwritten social rules shouldn't dictate how anyone is doing at, my, at their job, in my opinion. Reaching out to those uh, different than you in friendship could help people learn these skills. Uh, managers could even assign some sort of buddy system uh, for everyone, especially new employees. Um, it could also help to physically write down a list of team expectations on how you should treat each other. Uh, little or no participation in group conversation. So uh, many adults with ASD specifically prefer one-on-one -on -one interactions opposed to group conversations. A lot of times I just stop listening to the, whatever people are talking about in a group setting because I don't know how to jump in and still keep track of what they're saying. It makes it so when I do jump in, it's real awkward <laughs> and abrupt or, or bad timing. And in the end, I just avoid it altogether. And then people see me as the quiet one, which I'm not. <laughs> so more structured questions in, from a manager perspective, um, especially with meetings that you have every week, uh, might help everyone feel more included. So everyone has a time slot to speak in and the loudest member isn't always the one that is always speaking. Uh, if you encounter someone who is constantly worried about how they're doing at work, this might be a sign that a better reward system is needed at your work. 
uh, people on the spectrum, especially like to know exactly what they did well. Uh, it helps me learn and do similar things like that in the future. Uh, some companies implement kudos comment boxes or badging systems. Um, at Allstate and Arity, they have these badges that they can give you. <laughs> And it'll tell you exactly what you did right. And you can put it on your internal Facebook of sorts um, <laughs> under your picture. And it, it, it's, it, it, I really like those. Um, and there's other systems that are like fist bumps or high fives or, and um, that can go towards merch and stuff of that nature. Uh, in the cases of extreme honesty, uh, it's often unexpected, but try to suggest a more appropriate comment <laughs> and try to move on because I promise you we don't mean to offend or annoy. Uh, being a rule stickler is great for visual designers uh, because knowing native patterns and rules surrounding them really uh, keeps my designs consistent. But sometimes it's nice when somebody else brings a new perspective and encourages me to break the rules um, for experimentation purposes, especially. Uh, there's a big reluctance to ask for help and it may stem from embarrassment or trying to hide social difficulties. And my adv best advice to managers is to encourage everyone to ask questions. So it's not so awkward when one person does. Uh, when someone is questioning you about every minute, minute detail of a wireframe, it might be a self-calming strategy because everyone likes to know what they can, can control and what they can't control. So excessive questioning is a tool to find those boundaries. While sometimes annoying, just answer the question and try to move on <laughs> because someone shouldn't be penalized socially <laughs> for this personality trait. Interruptions may make me have to start something all over again. Um, I've learned in recent years how to control my reactions to surprises. Um, but in school, people would find it funny when I was really focused on something to come up behind me and like tap me on the shoulder really quick and see how loud I squealed. Um, if this is happening in your workplace, it might mean that you need to provide some sort of quiet area or place where people can exclusively listen to music, um, a way that isn't busy or distracting. Also managers, you can ask others to be respectful of specific people because I don't think that's too much to ask. And finally, a lot of times atypical people might desire more senior roles but lack the confidence and social skills to get there. This is where managers can really step in and coach their employees. My yearly growth goal for last year was to become better at public speaking, something that is considered very difficult for autistics. And now this is my third public talk. Um, so we've talked about what managers can do to build a neurodiverse team and advice for those frustrated atypical job seekers. We've talked about healthy work environments and what we can do to improve them. I also went over several collaboration techniques that can be applied to people across the board. And for all the atypical folks in the audience, I'll leave you with a quote from J.P. Spears. The most pervasive disease that inflicts humanity is the disease of being normal. I don't think anyone's ever achieved an extraordinary life in terms of quality and success by excelling at normalcy. The fact that you are wired different is your greatest asset. And if you have a diagnosis, it can help you personally so you know what you need, but it shouldn't define you or hold you back from achieving what you want. And for all the neurotypical people in the audience, I hope you've learned some new techniques to nurture a more inclusive and diverse workplace because this room is made up of unique individuals that are all worth bringing into the conversation regardless of label. Try not to discriminate against one another, embrace diversity, and above all else, 
be human to each other. Thanks. Okay. I, I do have a voice. It's somewhat there. <laughs> Open for a few questions. Uh, but please keep in mind, keep them uh, short and direct because not only Amy has a voice for a limited time, but also our tech engineer has to uh, take everything away. <laughs> keep that in mind. Any questions? I received a survey today about important features for a new workspace we are setting up. I have never heard of, did you call it a health room? Or wellness room, I think that's what my current room, they kind of just lump mother's room and wellness room together as a slash, but um, yeah, it's usually some sort of room that has the blinds drawn or is just has no windows that has recessed lighting. Uh, yeah. Is this a known thing? I mean, if I were to, uh, suggest this would our people know what it meant? And that about a nursing room, yes, they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, that anyone could go in and get quiet. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's it's not just for calming down. Uh, some people use it for prayer um, if they have uh, a religion that they want to pray in the middle of the day. Um, some people. Uh, use it for yoga. There's usually yoga mats in them. Um, uh, the one at Motorola that I had had like a, a bed, but <laughs> which was a little awkward. <laughs> but uh, you were only allowed to be in there for 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's usually something that comes with in the corporate territory, um, but. My office at Arity has also had it, so, um, and that was relatively a smaller company until it got bigger, so. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, Amy, uh, could you repeat the question for the live stream? Oh, oh, sorry. I forgot to mention that, sorry. <laughs> Hi, thanks for sharing a lot of this. Um, I was curious about your recommendations on disclosure um, of one's neurodiverse status. Um, once you're already in the job, um, I have not told anybody except for one person. And at this point, like, should I? So, like, what's the benefit I see? Like, based on some of the suggestions, maybe like helping to be an advocate for other people who maybe have more needs or, or accommodations. Um, but you thought some. Uh, so she was asking, um, wow, my playback is really bad. <laughs> so in short, um, disclosure when you're already in a job. So okay. So she was saying that she was asking if, what the benefits of disclosing that you're neurodiverse after you've already been in a job. Okay. So, um. For me, I have accommodations that I have to ask for um, because um, I try to take Fridays and work from home. Um, and uh, I don't sit at my desk a lot because I go to, we have pods that you can go in and turn off the light and just work uh, for an hour at a, at a time throughout the office. Um, it, it might behoove you if you see benefits in it, but um, I don't, uh, it, it might be something that could set you up for discrimination and not, it would be a, a situation where um, people might not mean to be discriminatory against it, but it could happen. Um, but at the same time, you shouldn't, let it hold you back at all. <laughs> um, 
I said help. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to know, let you know, uh, straight out, I'm dyslexic, so I totally feel like you're describing this presentation from a different perspective. The question I have for you is, I find sometimes one of the challenges I have is now, today, you're expected to be communicating on so many different channels. you got Slack, email, meetings. I'm wondering what type of techniques you've come up with to deal with that constant barrage of different touch points, people trying to reach out to you. I know that in some ways it's actually a benefit, but you know, how do you deal with so many different ways of maintaining communication when people are maybe not coming up and talking to you, but they're constantly reaching out to you? Uh, she was asking, um, how do I deal with all the different types of communication that happens in the workplace um, with all the different channels that I'm being asked? And it's hard. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, um, I, I feel like hopefully the more I give this talk and the more that other people give similar talks that um, it'll change expectations rather than expecting everybody to fit this common mold of just being eternally accessible, not, and not accessible and this accessible, but, <laughs> but more uh, relating more to how people uh, take in information more and how people learn um, more because everybody has a, you know, in fourth grade, whenever they, they gave you uh, the test of like, what type of learner are you? Are you, do you learn by hearing things? Do you learn by seeing things? Or are you kinesthetic or, um, and really I feel like that kind of stuff should be weighed in more whenever you figure out how to communicate with your coworkers. Where have you found an artistic community? A community? Well, this is a, okay, she was asking um, where have I found a community, and I haven't. Um, I, I, again, I was only diagnosed a few years ago, specifically autistic, which is great, but also nobody talks about it. Nobody comes out and says, I'm autistic, because they might not need all of the things that I need. Um, and some people are, are, are too scared to even apply to certain positions because they are on the spectrum. And um, it, it's, that's what, this is a really odd way of me going about and doing this, but me giving this talk over time is very therapeutic and um, and hopefully it'll evolve with the more people that I meet and the more faces that I see and and the more perspectives that I see and things might completely change. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, you have a question about you. Uh yeah, yeah. My my Twitter is this. Um, it is also my Instagram, um, and there's lots of pictures of my dog. <laughs> Thanks. And also, if you